Hi, and welcome to the show. Subscribe at kevinmd.com slash podcast. Get CME for this episode by clicking on the CME link in the show notes. Today, we welcome Harvey Max Chachanoff. He's a psychiatrist. Today's Kevin MD article is titled Intensive Caring, Reminding Patients They Matter. Harvey, welcome to the show. Appreciate it. Glad to be here. So we'll get into your article in a little bit. First off, briefly share your story and journey. So uh, as you uh, I- indicated in the introduction, uh, I'm a psychiatrist. I, I did my uh, medical training at the University of Manitoba, became interested in the interface between psychiatry and medical oncology, went off to uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in the uh, mid to late uh, 1980s, uh, studied with some of the uh, you know, real pioneers in the area of psychooncology, folks like Jimmy Holland, William Breitbart, Kathleen Foley, came back to Winnipeg and in the early 90s, just kind of stumbled into the area of of palliative care and palliative care research. One of the first articles that we looked at uh, in terms of our research was looking at whether or not it was ever normal for people who were near the end of life to cover an earlier death. And I found the kind of the, the intellectual engagement that I felt, the curiosity, was really quite uh, astounding. And so one project led to an X and I really have spent the entirety of my uh, my academic career in the area of palliative care, trying to explore what I think of as kind of the, uh, the experiential landscape of end of life care. So talk to me more about that intersection between psychiatry and palliative care. What would you say are the major touch points where they intersect? Well, you know, a while ago, I, uh, I published an article that I called the, the secret is out. Patients are people with feelings that matter. Uh, essentially, you know, in, in contemporary medicine, it's, it's all too common for us to become really kind of very, very focused on the biological dimensions of whatever particular ailment we're talking about, you know, whether it's cancer or end organ disease or w- whatever it might happen to be. But what I found during the course of my work and certainly have substantiated during the the course of now multiple studies over over several decades is that the I mean the human experience of being ill is something that needs to be attended to and that when we lose sight of that patients suffer and they suffer because they feel that they have somehow come to be seen as the the ailment that they have rather than the person that they are. So large portions of of my studies over the years have really looked at ways, how can we ensure that personhood is on our clinical radar? And what can we do to safeguard when we see the patient being in jeopardy of patienthood somehow eclipsing personhood? So those are the, the, the critical touch points. And of course, they have involved us delving into various facets of that. So for instance, we have looked at issues related to to human dignity in the course of receiving uh, palliative and end of life care, and as such have developed uh, instruments that allow us to to measure, to quantify dignity related distress. Um, We have developed brief interventions that allow us to create probes for healthcare providers to elicit personhood by asking something we call the patient dignity question. What should we know about you as a person in order to give you the best care possible? We've even developed psychotherapeutic approaches that are really based on the idea of legacy and generativity so that we can allow somebody to create for for those that they'll eventually leave behind uh, a legacy that contains the essence of what they would want known, what they would want remembered, and what words they would like conveyed to people who will outlive them. Your most recent article was published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology. It's titled, Intensive Caring, Reminding Patients They Matter. Now, how did this particular article come together? Well, I would say, I mean, the inspiration for this article really comes from Dame Cicely Saunders. And, and, and Dame Cicely, as you likely know, was the founder of the modern hospice movement. She founded St. Christopher's Hospice. And there was a very famous adage that she was known for, which is, you matter because you are you, and you matter to the end of your life. And that really has become the philosophical primary tenant of palliative end-of-life care. but 
what I began to think about and what I realized is that although that is so fundamentally important in terms of our, our, our mindset when we move forward in providing palliative care, Dame Cicely did not provide us with a template for how to remind patients they matter, for how to offer care that in fact embodies ways of reminding patients that they matter. So intensive caring was kind of a, a bit of a play on words, recognizing that when people are in dire physical straits, we provide them intensive care. But what happens when people are in psychological or existential or spiritual dire straits? What can we offer them? Well, we can offer them intensive caring, which essentially is a series of empirically based approaches uh, that I review in that article <clears throat> that really talk about how we can address and be in the presence of, of suffering. Uh, one of the, the, the primary, and maybe let me, let me just back up for a moment to say that the elements of intensive ca caring uh, include things like non-abandonment. Mm -hmm. So I mean, the, the impulse when we feel helpless and we feel a sense of futility is to withdraw from care. And of course, all of that have seen and experienced that either personally or in the course of mentors that we've been or that we've been exposed to during the course of our, our training. And yet we know that if we remain present, that we are able to make differences that are really quite profound. Uh, we can take an interest in who that person is. We can provide them affirmation that really underscores their sense of continued sense of being deserved of honor, respect, or esteem. We take an interest in that person. We sometimes, an element of intensive caring is holding on to hope. And even while people, uh, patients themselves may lose hope, if we are able to embrace hope, then it is the hope for achieving certain things that are still possible even towards the end of life, like you know, achieving a good death, being able to engage in meaningful conversations, meaningful disclosures, even towards that the end of time, giving patients and families an opportunity to express caring or remorse or love or whatever it is that needs to be done during those during those times. Also, another element of intensive caring has to do with an affirming tone or what we've called okay. therapeutic presence. So again, giving the message to the healthcare provider that by virtue of your presence, things like compassion, being respectful, trustworthy, being fully present, these are things that can provide affirmation that this person in spite of their various encumbrances, still matter. Your presence matter and they matter. And then the final elements uh, of uh, intensive caring is what I have coined therapeutic humility. And this comes out of a, a study that we did looking at the elements of optimal therapeutic communication. It was a, a publication that appeared in Cancer a number of years ago. And therapeutic humility is really having the wisdom to step into a clinical scenario where you don't necessarily have, often don't have a therapeutic fix. And, and this really segues to kind of a, a, a shift in, in paradigm that intensive caring talks about, which is in essence, the medical paradigm, the traditional medical paradigm is that we examine, we diagnose and we fix. I mean, that is the thing that brought most of us into, into medicine. Yeah. Um, what we eventually learned, though, is that there are things in medicine and things in life that really defy our ability to fix. Now, that leaves us one of two choices. Either we say, well, anything that is no longer with them in the realm of fix is not in my lane. And so we withdraw or we say, you know, let the social worker, let the let the spiritual care provider, you know, do that kind of care. That's not my jam. Or we enter into those encounters, yielding the idea that somehow everything that we see has a readily available solution. And so the shift in paradigm from examine, diagnose, and fix is to first off, understand who is this person. I mean, you know, that, that is our examination, essentially, is to find out about personhood. The diagnosis is really then yields to 
how do we understand the nature of their suffering? And the fix, by virtue of therapeutic humility, has to yield to this idea of providing comfort, being present with. And I think, you know, intuitively, all, you know, experienced clinicians know that when you enter into a scenario where, you know, you don't have something that can reverse that depth of suffering, showing up matters. You know, a patient has just died and the family is gathered by the bedside. What do you do? You show up. A patient has just had, you know, the horrible realization that they're on a path that is very different from the curative one that I hope for. What do you do? You show up. Not because you can shift that reality, but being there Mm -hmm. makes a difference. And being there shows that, in fact, they matter. And, you know, sometimes when people listen to me speak about this, they say, well, you know, this, this sort of sounds like kind of pretty touchy feely. This is kind of the soft side of medicine. And I say, well, there's a, and I mean, I think it's a a profound side of medicine, by the way, my most recent book is called dignity and care, the human side uh, of medicine. And I think all of us, if we're going to be uh, practicing, need to come back to my opening comment that patients are people with, with feelings that matter. So we need to I believe, embrace that. And it is the way that all of us need to be practicing care. As you know, in intensive care settings in Canada and the United States, sometimes doing this may be in tension with how little time a lot of the clinical staff has. So what kind of tips can you share with that clinical staff to incorporate some of these ideas in the, in, in the everyday critical care setting? Sure. I guess, I, I mean, time is always uh, a luxury. I mean, and, you know, having more time, you know, a- allows for, uh, you know, being able to kind of foster these kind of, of, of deep therapeutic alliances. But one of the important concepts that emerges from some of the work we've done over the years is a, something we call the tone of care, you know, and this comes from studies that we've done on looking at what reinforces or undermines a patient's sense of dignity and tone of care. You know, that, that, that aura, that quality, those kind of ineffables about how you come across to the patient, not based on what you're doing or what you're saying, but your way of being can make a profound difference for whether or not somebody feels kind of embraced in your care uh, and attention or simply feels like, you know, just a patient. And the great irony, of course, is that we train our entire lives to look after patients and people get really pissed off if they feel that they're being treated just like a patient because patient is generic. Patient is kind of formulaic, whereas personhood, individuality is the antithesis of that. So what I say to people who say, you know, we just don't have the time is the following. It's about the tone of care. If you've got a minute, In that minute, you can either take advantage of being able to make a good impression or a bad impression. It's the same one minute. There's a a wonderful study, a randomized control trial of sitting versus standing on the first visit of orthopedic surgeons following spinal surgery for patients. What did they find? And again, you know, randomized control trial, the only thing that happens differently in the first visit is they are randomized to either sit or stand the first time that they meet with a patient post-surgery. Well, the amount of time that they sit at the bedside is no, or stand at the bedside is no different, just over a minute. But when the clinician sits, the perception of the patient is that they were there five times as long. And 95% of those patients report satisfaction with the encounter versus only about 50 to 60%. Same physician, same encounter, no change in what actually transpires, but the perception is that only in 50 to 60% of instances do they report satisfaction. Mm -hmm. So I say time is a luxury, but in that time, you can be uh, an effective listener. You can be completely present if you choose to be. The other thing, of course, is to point out that, you know, what happens if we don't take that additional time? If we don't take that additional time, what we find out is, and again, there have been studies that show the most likely reason that you might be the subject of litigation is not because of medical misadventure, 
but because of communication issues. Sure. You know, people will forgive you almost anything, but they won't forgive your lack of kindness. So if you take the extra moments to be human and attentive, you will avoid, you know, the possibilities of unhappy patients, avoid the possibilities of litigation, avoid discordance in, in goals of care. The other thing, by the way, that we have found is that if you avail yourselves of information pertaining to personhood, we find in our studies that that is associated with heightened job satisfaction, which means if you engage in this kind of care, it also is going to confer protection against what we know, you know, in post COVID era is, you know, kind of a tsunami of physician sense of lack of well being and and professional burnout. We're talking to Harvey Max Chochinoff. He's a psychiatrist. We're talking about his article, Intensive Caring, Reminding Patients They Matter. Harvey, let's end off with some take-home messages that you want to leave with the Kevin MD audience. Take-home messages. Well, again, I mean, I would return to my that article I mentioned at the outset. Patients are people with feelings that matter. We need to know that, I mean, all of our patients have feelings and those feelings matter. And if we're not attentive to them, if we somehow see that as not being within our lane or scope of practice, we're going to be doing a disservice to our patients, to their families, and to ourselves. I guess another take-home message I would say is, you know, I've I published a number of years ago in the British Medical Journal an article called The ABCDs of Dignity Conserving Care. And those are meant to embody core efficiencies for anyone who deigns to enter into providing patients care. A is for attitude. Your attitude towards patients makes a difference. The way you see them and perceive them is fundamentally going to change their medical experience with you or their medical encounter. B is for behavior, and we've already reviewed simple behaviors like sitting versus standing make a profound difference. Meeting someone's gaze, not meeting someone's gaze, showing up. C is for compassion, you know, your ability to recognize besides the biological events that are unfolding, the human pathos of what happens in the course of providing care. So compassion is your ability to understand that and your willingness to respond to that. And D is for dialogue conversations with patients, uh, not only conversations that elicit details about their clinical condition, but elicit information about who they are. And it doesn't have to be complicated. Maybe I'll, I'll end with one tiny vignette. I remember passing by the office of a, a wonderful medical oncologist, James Johnson, who is a, a very busy hematologist oncologist. And as the door to his office was closing, the last thing I heard him say to the patient, and this is a very busy clinician, mm -hmm. the last thing I heard him saying to, the, to his patient was, so how was that vacation? And the door shut. I promise you that minutes later, they were not sitting looking through a photo album, but in acknowledging you know, the person, what he is saying is that, you know, leukemia lymphoma may not take vacations, but people do. So we need to remember that. And we need to incorporate this idea of personhood as being something that needs to be on our clinical radar. Harvey, thank you so much for sharing your perspective and insight. And thanks for coming on to the show.